So that's it for housekeeping. Let's go ahead and start today's webinar, Accelerating CI-CD with Observability. Boop. So let's first give all of our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. George, why don't you start? Uh, sure. Hi, I'm George Miranda, Head of Ecosystem and Partnerships uh, here at Honeycomb. You can find me on Twitter at gmiranda23, and I am one of uh, the book's co-authors along with Liz. Liz. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm your co-host today, and I also indeed uh, co-authored uh, co Observability Engineering. And I've been at Honeycomb for about three and a half years, uh, working as a developer advocate. And prior to that, I spent uh, about a decade working at Google as a site reliability engineer. And today, we're very delighted to be joined by Frank. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, Liz. Thank you. Hey, George. Hey. It's so nice to be here. I am an engineer at Slack, and I've had a pleasure of working here for the past three and a half years where observability has helped us solve a lot of problems in CI and CD. And, and you also contributed um, a chapter of the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, I contributed a chapter of the book. Um, I had such a blast um, giving a few internal talks about this and gave a talk at Olicon a few years ago. Um, that's Honeycomb's annual observability conference. Um, and I had so much fun that um, we encoded some of that talk into the book chapter. And we're going to be sharing some of the contents today. Excellent. Boop. So just to level us, sure. said everyone, um, this is an ongoing series in which we go through some of the material from observability engineering and give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look at kind of what was left on the cutting room floor, what we wish we could have told you more about, as well as you know, thing, things that we think that you can do to mesh together concepts from the book with Honeycomb, the product. So last time on this series, we talked about um, <clears throat> Last time in this series, we talked about everything from, you know, how do you actually handle service level objectives in Honeycomb? How do you actually think about measuring the reliability levels of your service? And how do you translate that into concretely being able to categorize events as good, bad, or not applicable? So that you can then, uh, so that you can, you can then get an idea of what your customers are going through and be able to quickly debug. And to tie that to observability so that you actually can debug rather than be scratching your head wondering like, you know, hey, what's, what's going on here? In previous episodes, we've also covered things like how structured events differ from traces, uh, differ from metrics. We've talked about how to, uh, how to foster a culture of observability inside of your organization. So I really do encourage you to check out prior episodes if any of the titles uh, pique your interest. Um, but we'll just kind of be over the next couple of months. We'll just going to we're just going to keep on plowing ahead through the rest of the book and make sure that we give each and every chapter kind of that behind the scenes treatment. Uh, George, did I miss anything there? Uh, no, I think that's great. Uh, I, there's been a lot of content that we've covered so far. I think we're about uh, just short of two thirds of the way through the book. Uh, so the only things that I want to call out for this particular session are uh, like Liz mentioned, right? Uh, structured white events are the building block of observability. And although they differ from traces, we also have looked at how traces are really just an interconnected series of logs. I think that's really gonna come into play, especially as we're looking at how we instrument what's happening inside of our build pipelines. So if you want more info on that, check out the previous sessions. And then I also think that the, uh, the session on the core analysis loop um, is really, really insightful because it's all about taking those structured white events, right? And, and the rich context that's in those and using those to create a debugging experience, right? So you can just sort of look at the data, look at the telemetry that's coming out of your system and very quickly zero in on where issues are happening, right? So that's gonna be kind of a core assumption throughout today's talk as we look at understanding what's happening in your CI CD pipelines. Uh, and so if you, if you wanna dive into that, uh, we'll probably talk about it as it comes up, um, but I, I really highly recommend that episode as well. So um, I think- Yeah, in think essence, what today's session is about is today's session is about applying those core analysis loop uh, tools to your CI system, right? So it's kind of this domain specific application once you have some understanding of how, what the kind of building blocks of observability are. 
And with that, uh, Boop, let's go ahead and take it over. Uh, the floor is yours, Frank, to uh, talk about your chapter. Cool. And I'm like a pretty informal speaker. So if anyone has a question, just feel free to like raise a hand um, or maybe ask, a, ask the question in chat and maybe we could just um, answer that live um, throughout the session. Um, by the way, again, I'm Frank, he, him. Um, we're going to talk about what observability in CI and CD look like. Um, I'm going to share my curiosity in exploring the space and help you get excited um, to look at your own distributed systems in a similar way with traces. Um, so at Slack, uh, we operate as a hub and spoke model for platform teams that instrument stuff and work with engineering teams to build features, releases, and services for your Slack experience. And so I spent a lot of my time instrumenting platforms where it can maximize um, both our individual and our internal tooling leverage with lower effort and friction and be able to gain massive insights throughout many teams. Um, throughout the past couple of years, um, whoa, it's weird. Uh, I've been at Slack for three and a half years already. Um, I, <laughs> I've worked with probably 20 teams at this point to instrument and understand different parts of their stack to solve business problems. So like this can be like a one-off afternoon instrumentation of a platform using like Otel, for example, like excellent, like I've been playing with the excellent Golang libraries or internal libraries written in Hackling or even Shell. Um, even the tiniest bit can help you understand parts of um, your system that you thought you understood, but may have been invisible. One of the most delightful uh, phrases I can hear is, oh, I had no idea that was so slow. Or I thought that service was slow, but look at, look at these traces. They're like a lot faster than we would have expected. And so some of these business problems over the last few years we were able to solve uh, were significantly enhanced by improved observability. So um, like one of these is um, our CI spend. We had a 10X improvement over in spend over baseline growth. Um, and one of the uh, examples I'm going to give a little bit, we're going to show some code, show uh, an internal document. Uh, we talk about uh, many of our like slower uh, CI systems. And recently, as in just this past week, we we're able to publish an article on how we went from frequent incidents to uh, zero cascading internal incidents uh, by instrumenting circuit breakers. And we understood a lot of this through observability and understanding how uh, background jobs and um, events propagated through CI. And finally, uh, for um, if any of you have flaky tests, we were able to debug multiple platforms flakiness and with cultural and pipeline changes, reduced our flakes per PR by about 10X. You know, there's, there's one thing I wanna add here, Frank, just to like sort of in the context of everything that we've been doing. What I, what I particularly love about this chapter and the way that it's inserted in the book is that sort of the first half of the book, and this chapter is actually right around kind of, kind of the halfway point, um, uh, has, it's been about looking at your code running in production, right? And that's kind of been the focus of most of what we're doing with, the, with observability. But I think what you're, what you're highlighting here in, in, in that intro is that any ever-changing environment, right? Any environment that, that has... Uh, lots of variation in it, like, you know, if you've got a particularly complex build system or like variability in pipelines and which tests are running, like any, any, uh, uh, I guess any environment where there's a reasonable amount of change that you can't always reason your way through, that is a really great fit for observability, right? And so this is sort of the first chapter where we kind of back away from the like running in prod use case. And we just sort of look at software, like very prod adjacent, uh, to, to illustrate that point. And I think one of the things that I love that you point out in the chapter is that in production, right? One of the hardest things to troubleshoot is when your service is slow. And one of the things in, in pre-production, right? Is, is it flaky, right? Like, how do you troubleshoot that? How do you start getting around that? So I just wanted to sort of tee that up because I think uh, yeah, you do a really good job of, of, of framing that in the chapter. And 
It's so there's also the um, XKCD hummock, right? Like, you know, where you have a bunch of software developers who are like fighting with foam stores and like their manager pokes their head out and like, is like, what are you doing? Aren't you supposed to be working? And they're like, my code's building, right? Like, and it's like, does it have to be this way that every time you do a build, you have to, you know, walk away from your computer for, for half an hour while you wait for that to happen, right? Can't we have a faster feedback loop? Because yes, it's true. Customer experience really matters, right? Like that impacts revenue a lot, but developer time, it's one of the most precious things that your company has, right? Like you have a finite number of developers, you're trying to get more done. Wouldn't it be nice if you could force multiply those developers to go faster? And thank you both so much. Um, uh, and just like a small tease, um, at the tail end of this, we're gonna like walk through some code and look at what CD looks like with a similarly instrumented pipeline. Um, if any of you use Kubernetes, um, you'll, uh, know that, well, image builds sometimes take a while, um, grabbing dependencies sometimes take a while. And if you have a particularly complex image, um, understanding how things are built, how to set up canary, like what your canary system, uh, and rollout even looks like, uh, is incredibly interesting. And we'll like both like show some dashboards and some live code related to that. Um, so relating back to the previous chapters. Um, so I just want to spend a moment and like talk about developer productivity and business goals. Um, just like what uh, Liz and George were talking about, it's like, how might we use engineering to build tools and programs to get Slack software to customers faster and with higher quality? And it's been a fun journey to be on at Slack Tales. Um, I've, been, I've worked with teams that have the opportunity to make engineering at Slack simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. And so in this little graph, um, it shows ARR, but it's like both Slack customer and code bases grew really quickly over the last six years. So how might we create better internal tools for engineers to build, test, release, and observe deployed code? Well, there's challenges. As great philosopher Uncle Ben from Spider-Man once said, with great power comes great responsibility. In the same way that it's exciting, there's a shadow side to great growth in customer code bases. There's an increase in complexity, oftentimes with fuzzy service and team boundaries, and here's like a really simplified diagram of Slack for desktop and mobile clients. Slack evolved from a single web app and a hackling monorepo to a topology of many languages, services, and clients to serve different needs. The core business logic lives in web app and routes to other services like a distributed clash, uh, cache called Flannel, distributed MySQL called My, uh, Vitesse, search and discovery, and many others. And oftentimes internal tools were built quickly and scaled just enough for Slack's main monorepo web app. In 2019, when I joined, our internal tools team was growing and already about sixfold. Today, the internal tools team consists of about 60 people and our larger department for developer productivity is about 290. And hopefully this resonates as well. Um, services are reasoned about individually within team silos using logs and metrics frequently. Uh, for example, the, the test team, I created a Prometheus metric for errors with different dimensions that are meaningful for development. A mother, another team might create a circuit break for error rate, but misunderstand the nuance and then misuse this metric at a course level without context at a later point. And finally, user experiences in CI and CD are somewhat unique. Um, when we compare, when compared to uh, traditional distributor tracing use cases for things like APIs, CI workflows might span over developer environments, commits different async parts of the infra and end-to-end -end span days or even weeks. So given this, how might we do better? Um, I thought you could create massive business results when people speak the same language and reason about data using that same language. Oftentimes one team's definition of dimension X means something completely different between teams and especially business groups. So let's take a new approach. How might we create a common infrastructure and language to increase legibility and unpack complexity across teams? How might we create an integrated diagnosis and reasoning about complex systems interactions with people in Slack? And how might we evolve our observability culture? How can we best share this with tooling, with teams that need it? And so here's a really simplified view of our CI workflows for users and infrastructure. I'm gonna use web app and end-to-end -end test for the purposes of this illustration um, because web app is where most engineers at Slack spend most of the development time. It ties together business logic from each client and dependent service. 
And hopefully the CI workflow looks a little bit familiar. Um, you submit code, uh, push it to GitHub, it opens a PR. Um, we use a system called, an internal system called Checkpoint that receives a single, like a notification that a commit happened um, and then decides, hey, what tests do I need to run? What builds do I need to run? And presents the user with test results. And it bridges uh, user workflows between GitHub Enterprise, AWS services like S3 and Kubernetes, Jenkins, console, and test environments um, that run miniature versions of Slack web app, um, as well as job queue workers to drive some of Slack's asynchronous workflows. Um, and just if uh, anyone here doesn't use Slack, um, I'm sorry, that was just like an assumption I made. It's an asynchronous messaging platform, kind of like WhatsApp for businesses. Or that's how I explain it to my grandma um, that has really great search. Um, and so a lot of these async workflows are like, hey, how do we propagate new events into a distributed cache and um, our search indices? And so now we're gonna talk a little about, like I alluded to this a second ago, like what does instrumenting a pipeline look like? Um, this rough is roughly analogous to the previous slide where we saw, hey, um, an event come into Checkpoint and Checkpoint kicks off a potential build and potential tests. And so we add part dimensions to many parts of CI and to borrow Charity's framing on this, it's, uh, this allows us to instrument first and then slice, dice, mix, and match. Um, I alluded to like a lot of the existing CI logic uh, when I joined was written by the CTO and early employees. It was mostly untouched for four years. It worked just well enough. And today there's like a lot more downstream services from web app. Um, the cardinality for CI traces are like quite different from other services, uh, production services like web app or Vitesse or flannel because it has lower volume. So we have less of a need for sampling, but higher criticality because these are much earlier in development process and affect how quickly people um, can develop code, uh, respond to incidents in the wild. And of course, um, get your code to users. And this graphic shows a super high zoomed out view for individual traces and what dimensions they might use in CI. Um, uh, O'Reilly helped us create a like nicer view of this and uh, nicely types it in the book. And we can um, share that potentially after this. In a single trace, for example, in a test, um, we capture all the data shown in the rightmost column. My apologies if it's um, a little bit fuzzy zoom sometimes there's trouble with that. Uh, and with it, it might capture and, and allow you to track related traces for a single or shared dimension. For example, you might be able to jump from a test trace to look at, hey, where have, how did all the other tests from the single build go? Um, with, did they all fail? Um, or you could find all tests or builds or CI orchestration background jobs for a single commit to see if um, there are any common um, outcomes. For example, wanna, performance I, or failures. I, I want to highlight a thing that's happening here, if, if I can, if I can interrupt for a moment. So one of no. the things that I, I particularly love about this chapter, especially you know, sort of talking about like transitions that are happening in the book, um, section wise, right? Uh, this is the last chapter of the book where we talk about just sort of like what observability is and use cases and where it operates. And then the book goes into operating at scale and then or like team uh, and organizational practices. And what I really want to highlight here is that what you're talking about is creating shared libraries, right? Like co common bits of telemetry, common dimensions that are used and making those available to teams as, as shared libraries as a start, right? So like Everybody sees this when they are, uh, you know, looking at their CI jobs. And this is one of the patterns that I think comes into play, especially when we talk about org-wide adoption, right? Just having some standards for this. And what I love about this graphic is how we see like shared context propagate throughout the process, right? 
In layer one, like common, like the orchestration has some common fields. And then in build, we see those common fields along with any of your build related info. And then tests, right, has all of that along with test related info. And I don't know if you can, like, if you've zoomed in and it's, I mean, it looks clear to me, but I don't know if it looks clear to me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, one of the one of the fields that I really love in here is um, like test run reason, right? Like, why did this test, like if it ran, what triggered it, right? Like, why is that there? And I think that sort of context is is huge, right? And and I think setting an expectation that uh, one, you're going to be capturing that, right? I think as you're writing tests, you know, like I, I would think, and tell me if I'm wrong, Frank, that you know, as, as somebody writing tests and, you know, creating that sort of output, uh, it gives you that that sort of debugging visibility that you want later on in the process when you're trying to figure out like, hey, like, why did this thing fire? But I don't know, I mean, is that, is, do you see folks in, in your organization start thinking about the kind of telemetry that they are writing along with their tests? Yeah, absolutely, like, yes. And I think for many teams, after you have a common library and some good exemplar, like archetype bits of code that you might be able to like copy paste, uh, tracing becomes a core part of your development process. Um, I would say um, at least 30% of new features, probably let's probably higher than that in internal tooling, oftentimes gets um, traced first um, and might like run um, as a dark feature or like dark deploy where we um, replicate requests over to this new system just to see how it performs. And we're able to like compare uh, and mix and match uh, the new feature versus the old. And having that as part of like your core development cycle, it's like you can't imagine doing development without this after a little bit. Um, and so like anytime I tackle a new problem now, uh, so like one of the one of the projects that is really exciting is like, hey, like how do we transform like a mostly chef based deployment system, like chef and console based deployment system running on EC2 to Kubernetes? And how might we like reduce a lot of the complexity uh, of like a really complex system that relies on probably upwards of like right now 20 chef recipes and like probably like roughly the same amount of like images that go into a single monolithic service. Um, like how do you actually unpack a lot of that complexity and express it in a way that uh, is both legible and lets you act on it in a relatively like fast feedback cycle. Awesome. I think what the other really interesting thing I should hear what you're describing is right, like when you are trying to transition systems and you're trying to make sure that both systems behave similarly while you're changing the internals of the engine, right? Like that is a crucial moment where you really need that visibility into what's going on to make sure you haven't broken something. The only thing that I'll add to that is, is as I was, I was hearing you describe that, Frank, I think one of the things that I love, you know, the fact that so many new features that roll out, you know, are, are traced first, I think is sort of a testament to what happens when you provide that shared starting point as a context for folks working in the system to start thinking about like what that telemetry is, what that you know observability experience is, and uh, I, I I wanted to bring that up because in an earlier episode, maybe two episodes ago or so, uh, we we had a question centering around right like how you write instrumentation, like what that shared approach is, and ways to roll that out. And I think here we've got a really good clear uh, demonstration of like how that works in the, the CI CD like build pipeline settings. Um, and uh, and I think that like while this is a build specific example of sort of what that experience looks like, I think it's it's more universally applicable to all of your telemetry in general. So just wanted to kind of highlight that because I think this this problem this portion of the book is probably the one place where we really make that concrete. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we paused on that for a minute. So thank you again for sharing. Like if you all ever feel like writing a second edition, I would love to contribute like maybe like some more around CD. Cause I feel like there's um, like CIs where uh, we had a lot of fires over the last few years. Mm -hmm. 
but on the CD side of the world, I feel like it actually becomes um, uh, more obvious for many people who like uh, can feel that pain of really complex builds mm -hmm. in their CD. And again, it's just like, it's no different on the CD side of the world. It's just builds and tests and deep, like system action, system like workflows all the way down. Uh, but I think the complexity is a lot more obvious uh, for for like many of the like people I talk to. It, it's funny that you say that. Um, I don't I don't know about necessarily like next edition of the book, but I know one of the things yeah. working on internally at Honeycomb is looking at um, deploy patterns using feature flags, mm. right, and trying to capture like what was the actual execution path that was used. Um, so like I think those those are things that we do internally at Honeycomb, and we are trying to figure out like how to package that up and share it a little more broadly, but that that's great, Frank, actually like great minds. We're, we're both kind of thinking about the same use cases. So maybe maybe nope. we'll save that for like a, like a future webinar episode. Um, but also folks like, like yeah, just, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I think that would be fun to just jam on for a while. Cause like yeah. I can just show a series of PRs from like myself and other people that like, hey, here's a feature, here's a feature flag that we don't know how this will perform, but Here's like our canary build of it for the like, and then how we do comparisons, which probably is like, I imagine like one of the questions that I like really loved hearing about was like um, how you all tested Gravitron 3 um, instances. And it's like something that like we've done internally, um, but some of that was done pre-tracing and it'd be cool to actually show, well, here's how we actually tested that with tracing. We just like up to this part of the fleet, made it roughly equal to our old fleet and then did a like mix and match, which was right. pretty Doing that cool. AB yeah. comparison and even better, right? Like not just, you know, oh, the pipeline was X percent faster, but here are the tests that got faster. Here are the tests got slower, right? Like, you know, yeah. hey, maybe there's some yeah. assembly code for X86 hidden here, right? Like these are things that you only uncover by having sufficient granularity and detail. So I think the important thing that people should be taking away here is that observability definitely helps you the more complex your pipeline is, but it's not necessarily a requirement to have a complex pipeline to benefit from observability. Absolutely. And, and Liz, the only thing that I would add to that is uh, the thing that you just described, right? Just like having all of the instrumentation in place to understand what is happening in this part of your system. When, when something rolls around, like new generations of Graviton that you want to test, right? That's when you already have the infrastructure set up to be able to run those sorts of uh, comparisons, right? And so one of the things that we talk about in observability, like you can answer all those questions you never even thought to ask. Like that is a prime example right there, right? Like set, setting up that sort of instrumentation, you didn't know that use case was available, but uh, having, you know, having all of that context, great. Now you can arbitrarily slice and dice it to Make any sort of comparison that you want, right? So, I feel I feel like we've like veered way off into just sort of uh, observability and like other ways to apply this. So, I'm going to sort of wrangle it back to Frank. So, pipeline specifically. Sorry, we went on a big tangent there. No, no, it's all good. Um, you know, like I'm a pretty informal speaker. Like I'll, in the next section, I was going to share a story about an experimental build for speeding up uh, both tests and builds. Um, and it's like pretty complex. Um, I talked about how I, uh, like was looking at our, like how quickly we could turn around tests to users. And I'll like zoom into this graphic in a sec, um, in, uh, in a different view. Um, but we started with this, um, honeycomb trace where, Hey, we instrumented this, we're able to see different stages of a test. You know, like in this one, we saw um, uh, a test runner spend 190 seconds where uh, we spent about eight seconds on checking out code. Uh, we spent about five seconds on requesting a, a test environment, uh, 30 seconds on test set, like test set up on the environment, and then two minutes on test execution, and another 13 seconds on uh, releasing that test environment. Um, and I was going to like talk through this in depth as well as like show some of like the heat maps that we use, like how we were able to slice and dice this. Um, 
but it was like it was interesting to, just alluding to like some of the things that Liz just talked to and I'm like I almost want to like if anyone can we do like a little poll or something I'm like I'm kind of curious because I want to show like some live dashboards and some like code on how we instrumented CD because I think like that's a little funner than like talking through an example from a while ago but like just like um can we run a poll for like the next two minutes on like if we want to deep dive here or like fast forward into like a live demo. Sure, just let us, uh, folks, let us know in the chat, uh, like whether yeah. whether you'd like to see live actual, like how things are happening now, or uh, if we continue in this direction. Cool. So I'll give give you like just like a super high level overview. It's like one way that um, other code bases at Slack using Hacklang, which is uh, like a um, a derivative of PHP that is now its own language uh, used in a few companies is like compiling PHP code into a reference repo. Counterintuitively, we saw this did not speed up our builds nor tests. And that was like the first experiment that we ran. Um, and so we didn't ship it. Um, we were able to run one of these, uh, one of these spans completely async. So like, why are we doing this? before we return results to users, great. Um, I think the people have spoken, we're gonna live demo. So, and then we parallelized a couple of more jobs. We reprovisioned a set of like test environments that were being funny. Um, I think it was, of course, probably something with Git or Git LFS. Um, and then we updated, uh, we saw how long builds were taking. So um, we upgraded those instances because that's really valuable time, a single build, is uh, the precursor to running like at the time, like 35 or 50 tests. And so we sped up our bills that increased the speed of our overall workflow. So right, we've, now, we've resoundingly gotten a live demo uh, request. Yeah. So let's do it, Frank, let's do let's it. Let's do it. Okay, so I'm gonna show, um, okay, let's go off live. Sweet, right, so I can, Close this up. Cool. Let me bring up our service services. Excellent. And how are we doing on time? Uh, we have 25 minutes left, and I'd like to leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. So we've got 15 minutes to cover your demo and my demo. So, like, this is, we got to make spot. it snappy, okay. but good. It's going to be both good and snappy. Okay, cool. So these are CI traces. Um, why don't we actually look at um, CD traces for a second so we can like look at simpler code and in a language you all probably use, Golang. Um, so I mentioned this By the a way, second for, ago. For attendees, um, um, there is a helpful option. Uh, if you go to view options under your viewing Frank Chen screen and do original size, do not use fit to window or else you will be uh, squinting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so here, um, I'm showing a pre-formulated query called Bedrock. Um, and so any of you that worked with Kubernetes, there's like a really high cognitive load and complexity. And Bedrock is Slack's internal um, platform for setting good defaults for things like kernel, security, networking, service, like service IDs and like account management. So what I'm gonna search for is um, just like a little demo path and like one pattern I find really nice is um, I always set um, some sort of query descriptor with a readme so that folk that pop into this or query for the first time or just get shared a query from someone else can always find a readme for like how to use different um, query patterns. So like in this one, I like talk about um, how to use launch and of course, sample implementations. So in this initial sample implementation in Bedrock, and this was um, uh, interesting for me because I'm developing an adjacent service for web app deploys, and I made um, this contribution to um, the Bedrock team's service that I'd never developed in before. I'm like, hey, you know, like I have some questions. Um, like I have a PR ready. It looks, it's like pretty innocuous. Um, and it's all of like 20 lines. Um, we use off-the-shelf OTEL 
libraries, followed by like a really, really, really simple set of attributes. And in the book, I reference creating a library. Um, and for the Golang side of the world, I created a very similar library that has good defaults for dimensions and has good defaults for where to send dimensions. So people and users of it can wrap a lot of boilerplate code into um, like a single couple of lines. So like we have boilerplate for exporter to send to our Jaeger endpoints and then a set of dimensions. And this initial PR, we have all of three dimensions, two span names um, and yeah, um, some like Go Inami stuff. So um, not super interesting. And today, I think this was maybe like a few months ago. Yeah, June uh, 7. And today, just taking a look at that same code, um, well, it's even easier. Instead of like the 30 line boilerplate, uh, we have a like six line boilerplate that, you know, get a context, initialize a trace provider, defer trace provider and exporter cleanup, um, set your OTAL tracer and then start tracing. Um, I think this and goes we're to the to same concept that we're doing in Honeycomb's product with the idea of launchers, right? Like where we and Lightstep have been collaborating on reducing the amount of setup and boilerplate you have to do and kind of standardizing all of this into libraries, right? Essentially, open telemetry is infinitely flexible, right? But it means that it needs a lot of config, but the most common options, that should always be very fast to do. So it creates that golden path for people to follow, whether it's application code instrumentation or in this case, a CI instrumentation. Yeah. and small caveat this is more like on the cd side of the world or like yeah uh, i don't know but it's like the lines are super blurred here um but one of the things that we could kind of see is um i'm going to talk about code for maybe two more minutes and then we'll hop over to look at some traces um and so over here we actually started using semcom which is like a good set of dimensions um uh, from OTEL on setting service names, namespaces, cloud regions, and cloud availability by reading a instance um, JSON that has stuff about, hey, like, um, what is, like, uh, okay, yeah, this will work. Like, hey, what is, um, like, Hey, what's here? It's like, oh, there's uh, there we go. There's like, oh yeah, there's like, hey, are you in GovCloud, uh, which is our um, government version of Slack? Um, like, where, what cloud position are you in? What, what's your host name? What's your proxy? Um, are you what base environment are you? What zone? What users can access you and all that good stuff. Um, and today, what's really nice, we get all of this stuff for free once people import the Slack trace library and use those six lines. Um, we have a few more spans because now we've instrumented the entire Bedrock platform. And um, you might be asking, well, what do these traces look like? Cool. Um, again, highly recommend a develop like a developer's guide and sample implementations so that people can like copy paste Slack specific instrumentations that are quite similar to OTEL. Um, but, you know, like have more code snippets related to um, this like stub. There we go, Bedrock. Great. That's so interesting, right? And, like that you're building this SDK on top of the OTEL SDK that kind of means that you have that built in standardization of, you know, what is the, uh, what is the attribute for availability zone? What is the attribute, you know, what values do we put into an error field, right? Like all of that standardized, which makes it easier to clarify. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's like adding on top of that, like uh, getting instance names, availability zones, and um, like what service they're running by default is incredibly like powerful and having like wrappers around that, like simplify the cognitive load of like, in development. So um, it's like, look at this. I think it's bedrock service equals. Let's look at some like bedrock traces because I'm like, hmm, 
we talked about web app for a second a few minutes ago. So like, what is what does this start to look like? Oh, is it? Oh, my dimension might not be right. Um, Bedrock service contains web app. Oh, cool. Like we see a lot of deployments. We see a lot of launches. We see a lot of syncs. That's pretty interesting. What, like what are syncs? Let's take a look at one of these. Oh, that's right. I remember what syncs are. Syncs are how artifacts and builds get from commercial Slack and then automatically deployed to Gov Slack. Cool. Like let's look at one of these traces. What does that like even look like? Um, and we had some telemetry around this from a single Prometheus metric, but seeing this, um, this representation of it was actually pretty interesting. We were able to see how long each of our different pools took and how long it took to copy the set of images from Slack developers to GovDevelop, like the Gov development platform. I, I think just to quickly level set everyone, just to back up a step, because this confused me too, right? Like the reason why there's this need for data per environment, uh, right? Like, you know, per GovCloud, per, you know, per, per region, it's because this is the CD part, not the CI part. So my demo is going to be focused on the CI, but what Frank is demoing is the CD of the pulling the Docker images and actually getting the containers running in prod. And, you know, there's a separate process for kind of measuring how you build the containers, which is, you know, region invariant, right? Like you build the containers once, but then they have to be pulled everywhere. Is that essentially correct, Frank? Thank you, Liz. Really good clarification. I think I'm just excited to show this. And sometimes <laughs> I forget to give some of that context. Thank you. Um, and I'm like, oh, how, like, and this was like really cool to see, like, hey, what does like starting a canary environment, what, which we call a dev amp look like? Let's look at some of like our slower traces here. I'm like, oh, look at this. There's someone creating an API. Like, let's go take a peek at what this looks like under the hood. And so we instrumented this um, CLI tool um, centered around Cobra and added spans for many of the entry points. And so a dev amp actually, we learned, well, or I learned, you know, like I haven't, um, been a developer on this platform until like pretty recently, it's like, oh yeah, we first, seems like it, we build an image and it doesn't, and interestingly, it doesn't use the same context because it's a separate Go process kicked off. Um, and so it's not completely stacked in a way that you might expect, but we see, hey, we spent 68 seconds building this image, doing some security scanning. And then we spent the remainder of the time launching into a single cluster called tools dev IAD2. And um, this was at lightning speed. Please send any questions. And I would love to hand it over to Liz. Awesome. So let me share one Chrome tab. So this is the currently uh, open set of Honeycomb pull requests. Um, but let's look for one of my previous pull requests. Um, so we can kind of compare and contrast the view that you get out of GitHub Actions or Circle CI and compare it to what you might expect to see inside of Honeycomb and how and how those two things are different. Um, so over here, uh, let's have a look at a change that I did to change our build configs, where I previously was um, trying to do a bunch of work to decrease the size of our production build artifacts. And I changed our Circle CI recipes, and I wanted to examine the impact this had on build times and on success of the application. So I'm going to go over here and have a quick look at, at what this looks like inside of, inside of GitHub, inside of Circle CI. And what we can see here is I can see this dependency graph, right, which is great, right? It helps me understand what depends upon what. But I have no idea what the critical path is, right? Like, why is this that this build took 10 minutes and 56 seconds and not nine minutes and 30 seconds, right? How do I shorten the amount of time that it takes to do this build? But the good news is there's actually a mechanism for me to jump directly from this, uh, from this Circle CI invocation to being able to see the actual, uh, to being able to see the actual trace of this build instead. 
Uh, so I think this is build dash events. So let me type that in. I have not logged in this morning. So sorry about that. Give me a moment. Demoed man. Four, six, three, seven, six, seven. Okay. So over here, we can immediately see kind of reduced down to individual steps. So I'm going to collapse all spans at the step. This gives me a much better handle on where my critical path latency is, right? Like what is causing this to be so slow? And I think the observation that I'm making here is what caused this build to be really slow was actually the fact that there's this large delay between when the Go tests finish and the JavaScript tests finish and when the Docker image build actually started. So it looks like the best thing that I can do to improve the speed of this build is actually improve, you know, talking to CircleCI about improving the speed with which uh, the machine image type is started up. Um, but also if I wanted to tackle some of the other things, right, like, you know, let's suppose that the amount of time being spent in, uh, in Go tests got excessively long. Right, I would be able to see, okay, like, you know, here's the amount of time spent doing setup, you know, doing MySQL setup, here's the amount of time being spent actually running the Go tests. So I could choose to make an informed decision, for instance, to say, I'm going to go from a Go parallelism of four right now, right? I run a quarter of the Go tests inside of each, uh, each parallel running job. I could say, you know, let's go to three parallel or let's go to five parallel jobs in order to maximize that resource trade-off versus the amount of time trade-off. But right now, what this data is showing me, if I collapse all spans at this depth again, is that everything here in this kind of initial pre-setup phase is taking all about the same amount of time, right? Like that nothing is, is particularly standing out. So kind of shorting the amount of time that it takes to run Go tests is not going to make the rest of the build go faster. So being able to get that level of visibility is super helpful for understanding, you know, where does this 10 minutes come from? But the other thing that I want to actually measure here is I want to measure the size of the binaries that are being built, right? Like the purpose of this change here was I wanted to strip all my binaries uh, before they before they go into container images. So the good news is that you know inside of the uh, inside of the tarball process there should be a uh, there sh there should be a attribute called um, called uh, asset size bytes hound arm 64. So I want to copy this field name because I want to go and actually run a new query and build events. I want to show a heat map of the asset size where the branch name is main. And I'm going to just run this query and I'm going to go back 60 days. Right, so we can see that my change had the desired effect, right? Like it dramatically shrank the build size from, you know, originally the binaries were, you know, sitting flat at nine gigs, nine gigs, nine gigs. Someone introduced a set of dependencies upon the entire Kubernetes client API. So that increased the binary size by 300 megs. And then I started stripping the binaries, which decreased the size of the binaries by, by a factor of half. And then we were able to back out some excess binaries that we didn't need. So right, like this kind of tracks our progress over time with keeping the binary size low, which is important for everything that Frank talked about in terms of amount of time it takes to pull the resources down, right? Like so, you don't only graph your amount of you know you don't only graph your build times. You also graph other properties. For instance, let's graph the min of JavaScript files and the max of TypeScript files, right? So we're in this process of trying to migrate. We're in this process of, oops, uh, wrong TypeScript files. That will do it, there we go. Right, we're trying to migrate all, all of our all of our uh, five, all of our JavaScript over to TypeScript, right? So we can track the progress of that migration over time. So we can see that over time we've we've gotten to you know 111 JavaScript files compared to 278, and over that comparative time frame that we've increased the number of TypeScript files by the same number by by about 200, right? So this is a mechanism of tracking the health of your build system over time. Now, I recognize we're a little short on time, so I'm going to really quickly jump to how do you actually get this started, right? How do you actually do this? So it's, it's two parts. 
So if you're using a partner like CircleCI, um, you can basically edit your CircleCI files. So I'm going to zoom this in a little bit so you can see. Right, so the first step is CircleCI has this pattern of orbs, which are this mechanism for importing common recipes. And then once you have the build events uh, imported, then you can use common operations like add context. It'll basically let you similarly to in OpenTelemetry, right, where you're adding key value pairs. This operates at the shell script level to kind of add key value pairs. Similarly, uh, in your setup job, you just say start trace in order to start the, uh, in order to create a trace that you can then visualize in Honeycomb and then watch build and finish runs at the end in order to close the trace off. And then any operation you want to measure happens inside of a job span and then you just run all of your steps inside of that, uh, inside of that helper. And then you can add as much context as you need along the way, for instance, the JavaScript and TypeScript files that I mentioned. But in the event that you're not using Circle CI, that's okay. Uh, the Honeycombio slash build events library exists. So that's a resource that you can go to. Um, but otherwise, right, there is the uh, orb slash honeycomb, uh, I think, build events, or maybe it's under Honeycombio slash build events. There it is, Honeycombio slash build events. We're listed as a Circle CI partner. So the install is super easy if you're using Circle CI. And the other thing that I'd highlight is if you're not able to use for whatever reason Honeycomb build events, if you're not able for some reason to use Circle CI, there is a project called Otel CLI that is written by our friends over at Equinix Lab slash, uh, slash packet. And that's basically a mechanism of using open telemetry from any shell script um, and being able to send trace spans from any shell script, which I think is a brilliant approach if you're, you know, working on anything from booting raw virtual machines as part of your uh, as part of your CD process, to if you have a bespoke CI pipeline, every CI pipeline except shell scripts, right? So you can always use Otel CLI or build events in the command line mode as your kind of lowest common denominator. So the one thing that I would add about build events and Otel CLI, right, is that at each step of this build process, right, in each job, we are essentially just creating a very context-rich context log line telling you what's happening and interconnecting all of those logs to say, this is what happened in this one job. So uh, I know we're running short on time, so I just want to plug both build events, uh, you know, so uh, uh, can be used with a number of CI platforms uh, to send data automatically to Honeycomb to replicate a lot of things that we see here. Uh, and then we, we covered a lot of ground. We also talked about how uh, uh, Slack is, um, looking at some of these problems uh, org wide. And I think the, the place where we really dived in and I want to highlight a comment that's in chat is around instrumentation uh, parameters, right? And like ways to get a little bit more opinionated about what is happening uh, with your instrumentation. And so I think that, uh, I want to read the comment here that basically says, um, to Liz's point that open telemetry is infinitely flexible, that makes it hard to jump into the deep end when you're brought into observability, but still new. So having opinionated practices from credible experts is quite helpful. And that is the value of the Honeycomb blog. So says the note. Um, and I think that that's true. A lot of the things that we are covering here uh, definitely fell outside of the context of the book. This is kind of like the best way to do things today. And so two things that I would say, one, uh, yes, I absolutely agree with the, the comment. Honeycomb blog is a great way to see what is new and what is interesting and what are the ways to do this. And when it comes to build events, uh, my team is working on a couple of guides to take some of the things that we saw in Liz's demo and actually make that much easier to follow on different CI platforms. Uh, we're targeting starting to release those in the next couple of weeks. So if you're really interested in how to make build events work for you, keep an eye out for those um, because I think they'll be useful. And back to you, Liz. And with that, uh, we're nearing the close of the event. Thank you very much for asking the questions throughout. As it turns out, it seems like we don't have quite as much time for a QA and a at the end. So um, we do have an event survey. Um, and if you fill out the survey and you uh, enter the secret word as well, which is event seven, um, you will get a free eye test and production t-shirt subject to shipping availability in your region. Um, but please make sure you don't dawdle on that survey because it does uh, close tomorrow, August 24th at 12 p.m. Pacific time. Um, so 
We also want to encourage you, if you have any follow-up questions, if you are a Honeycomb user, there is the ability to join the Honeycomb Slack. And if you join the Honeycomb Slack, you will be able to uh, join the book club channel where you can ask Frank and myself and George, as well as Charity, who is not able to make it today, any questions that you have about the book, about the material we cover during these sessions, or about how to apply these best practices uh, in your own work. And furthermore, um, the Honeycomb Developer Advocates do run a open office hours. Um, so if you go to honeycomb.io slash meet slash devro, um, you can just book in for half an hour to chat one on one with someone like myself, Jess Kerr, or, uh, or, or Martin Waits. Um, so I think that is it for all of our housekeeping. Let me just make sure that I check the notes. Um, I want to say again uh, to Frank, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for contributing the chapter to the book. We covered some amazing ground, so it was it was great to have you on the session. And yes, yeah, one last thing fun. is plugging uh, future events. Um, we have plenty of great content coming up. In, tomorrow, there's a webinar on how to send data to Honeycomb via the Hotel Collector. Uh, there's going to be another uh, two sessions on the Author's Cut series, and there is a Honeycomb Best Practices Office Hours uh, September 1st at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, so yeah, thank you very, very much for joining us today. We appreciate your time, and uh, please, do, uh, please do go fill out that survey. Again, like I'll leave that up on the screen for a second for you to, uh, for you to fill out the survey and get that t-shirt. Have a great day, everyone. Cheers. Thanks again.